Thank you so much, uh, Roddy, for that lovely introduction. And thanks uh, to everyone for, for joining uh, me here today, um, particularly when uh, my colleague Pat Kuehl is next door giving or you know, give this amazing talk where actually I would be if I were not here talking to you. Um, so, you know, normally when someone gives a talk like this, they sort of look back over their career and they talk about all the things that they've learned. And I'm not doing that today. Uh, I'm going to do something more fun. Um, I'm going to talk about something we don't know, um, something that psychological science has been largely overlooking. You know, of course we can find individual people who are doing the kind of science that I'm about to talk about, but what I'm going to be talking about really is more of a perspective on the entire field, um, and I'm going to suggest that there is a real opportunity for us uh, that if we take it could really transform the science. Um, because we're an audience of diverse disciplines, I'm going to ask that um, if you have questions about the methods and so on, that you hold those um, till the end. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully there'll be time at the end. I don't know, I'm running a little long with this talk, but I, I've tried to leave room for, for questions. Uh, so I thought to get us started, I would summarize the entire history of emotion in one slide for you. Um, ancient philosophers believed that the human mind was made up of mental faculties as types. Types of thoughts, types of perceptions, types of emotions, types of actions. In the domain of emotion, for example, there's anger and fear and sadness and so on. Um, philosophers call this folk psychology uh, categories or common sense categories. And in the 19th century, when the science of psychology was born, Neurologists and physiologists began to search for the physical basis of these types in the brain and in the body as a single set of features that defined the instances of a category, like anger, or, and separated and distinguished those from a different category, say fear. After several decades of failure, uh, scientists adjusted their questions. Instead of describing mental types in physical terms, they used functional terms. Um, to study thoughts, feelings, and perceptions solely by their causes and their effects. And from this era of psychology called functionalism, it was a very short jump to behaviorism where it was decided pretty much that mental events could not be studied scientifically and the mind disappeared as a topic in psychology. So there were only causes and effects. Now, this is an infamous period in science, in psychological science. Um, not a total loss. In fact, very important discoveries were made. But scientists eventually became dissatisfied with behaviorism for a fact, for a reason that every single person in this room knows. And that is that you have a mind. And science has to explain where that mind comes from in scientific terms. And so in the 1950s and 60s, the cognitive revolution in psychology reinstated the mind as a topic of scientific inquiry. But it was pretty much faculty psychology over again with a dash of functionalism and a lot of shiny new toys. The guiding assumption was again that humans, all humans, are endowed with a set of mental categories that are physical types types of memory, types of perception, types of emotion, types of action, and that each type has its own dedicated process and lives in its own uh, uh, dedicated set of physical causes in the brain and body. So if you have episodic memory, it's because you have an episodic memory system or process and you should be able to look into the brain and pinpoint where episodic memory is happening. Now, this approach has had some important successes for our field. Um, but what I'm going to suggest today is that there is another approach, uh, one that helps us explore how a human brain and body create a human mind and accounts for the ways in which a human mind changes with development, changes from uh, context to context, and how a single human brain um, can make many different kinds of human minds. And although I'm focusing largely on psychological science in this talk, what I have to say is relevant to other sciences too, um, because we are not the only ones who grapple with the question of whether or not we should be studying types, that is, 
uh, whether biological or psychological categories, behavioral categories are types, using a typological mindset. Um, is this actually the best way to approach uh, scientific inquiry? Now, all four of the psychological approaches that um, I just presented in the, our little history lesson uh, have something in common. They have a deep commitment to the idea that the mind is a linear relationship between simple causes and simple effects, where a few forces or variables um, have very strong effects on, on the system. There are many systems whose behaviors can be explained this way. For example, um, perturbed by simple causes that result in uh, very strong, simple, replicable effects, like the motions of the planets around the sun. Now, we know that actually planetary motion works more like a complex system um, with many nonlinear interacting forces, but it can be modeled as a mechanistic system using Newtonian mechanics. And actually, I understand that even modeling uh, satellites around a planet can be um, modeled using actually Ptolemaic um, equations. So very mechanistic uh, equations, even though the actual um, phenomenon is more like a complex system. In psychology, we generally speaking, again, this is a broad, uh, you know, speaking in broad generalities, broad terms, we generally try to observe the mind as a mechanistic system in experiments that attempt to isolate a single variable, or maybe two, manipulate it, and observe uh, strong effects that are easy to replicate. Historically, this has been the dominant approach to studying the mind and behavior in psychology. There might be small variation from, from you know, study to study, but this is generally assumed to be an issue of accuracy of measurement and maybe the skill and care with which experimenters um, are running their studies or um, uh, uh, analyzing their data. But um, the assumption is that, that, uh, that there's these linear causes and effects rather than some kind of complexity to the causation, the, the systems that cause the effects. The evolutionary biologist, uh, Richard Lewontin, has observed that this approach to science um, is not really applicable to biology because living organisms are complex systems with many, many nonlinear interacting uh, causes where any single variable has a weak effect on the outcome. And more generally, you can't really separate uh, you know, manipulating one variable and assume that all the others remain unaffected. And the consequence is that there's a combinatorial explosion in the causal patterns and in their outcomes. So tremendous variability in organisms that make up a biological category like a species, like our species, or any species, frankly. Lewontin further writes, all attempts to understand causes must necessarily involve the observation of variation. He's speaking about biology when he writes this, and I'm, uh, for this talk, going to suggest that the same is true for psychology, that we have to embrace it, um, not contain it in experimental, with our experimental methods. Furthermore, we're very lucky that Darwin actually gave us a tool for investigating variation and understanding its causes, um, and that's called population thinking, uh, named by uh, the evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer. Pop population thinking means that a biological category is a population of highly variable instances uh, where the variation is tied to the context or the situation. So, Variation among individual instances, like here, Olympians, um, is real and important in nature, whereas the type that describes the category is an abstraction. It's basically a fiction, and it might not actually exist in nature. You know, a lot of people think that on the origin of species, the great innovation of Darwin was natural selection, his, his discovery of natural selection, and of course that's true. But natural selection only works 
if there's variation to select on. And from my perspective, reading on the origin of species, the thing that really jumped out at me was the discussions of the um, careful observation of variation um, uh, that is what up until that time had been largely overlooked. So just to summarize, in a typological mindset, um, the mean of the distribution, the mean of uh, the variation in any measurement is a stati the statistical summary is what's real. And variation around the mean is considered to be error or incidental. In population thinking, the variation is real and the uh, statistical summary is an abstraction. So with this idea in mind, let's consider the typical experiment that we see in the science of emotion. Here I picked one paper, um, not for any reason other than it was published a few weeks ago in Nature Communications. So I thought, you know, AAAS would be good to pick a paper from Nature. <laughs> um, this ex <laughs> the experimenters show a movie, an American film, Forrest Gump that they believe will evoke a small handful of instances of emotion. Then they stipulate a small set of emotion labels coming from the English language, anger, sadness, fear, disgust, and so on. And then they have a small number of subjects from Italy uh, rate their experiences as they watch the film, and then they aggregate those ratings so that you have an average rating of anger and sadness and fear as, it as the average fluctuates throughout the film. Then you do the same thing with the brain data. In this case, it's uh, data from an fMRI study. So 14 people were scanned in Germany, and then the data was averaged. And then they used a fancy supervised machine learning algorithm to, um, find, to compare the two and find patterns that they uh, describe as um, biomarkers of the emotion categories, like this. So here what you're looking at is a lateral view of the brain, and they've pried apart the sylvian fissure between the blue and the uh, gold lines there. Um, and so what you're looking at are pa is a pattern for, for four emotion categories on the lateral surface uh, of the brain. So let's consider this experiment for a minute, the design. They, the uh, experiment restricts the number of emotional episodes sampled to a very small number. The data were analyzed from a small number of subjects. The statistical summary was assumed to be a good estimate of individual responses rather than an abstraction. Uh, and then um, it, the possibility of variation in the categories uh, within a person and across participants was basically ignored. And in fact, the possibility that there may be other emotional events that occur that are not named by English words was completely ignored. Uh, I'm not picking on this paper in particular because there's anything uh, notably wrong with it. Um, it's actually other than these things, right? I mean, actually, um, what, what I'm pointing out to you is not unique. Uh, to this paper. In fact, it's epidemic, really, to the study of emotion uh, as it currently exists. And in psychology, in general, you tend to see more studies like of this uh, type, um, hundreds and hundreds of studies um, using methods like this, which are published in the best journals. So let's consider a little more carefully um, uh, an example um, of physiological changes that occur, uh, so in, in a study like this, that physiological changes that occur um, during episodes of emotion. So here what I'm showing you on the y-axis, the vertical axis are li a list of um, physiological um, changes that can be measured um, during, uh, well, in any experiment, but uh, while, people, while emotion is being induced. And the x-axis represents the um, amount of change uh, in these physiological signals during uh, an emotional episode relative to a resting baseline. So in a given study, we might observe a pattern of changes uh, when people are sad that look like this. 
So an increase in heart rate, an increase in blood pressure, and maybe no change in skin conductance, which is um, the amount of um, electricity, which is an index of the electricity that's conducted across the um, skin uh, uh, when you're sweating. Well, it's an indication of a sympathetic nervous system arousal. So in a typical study, this would be reported as uh, the uh, physical um, changes that occur in sadness. But in a meta-analysis that we recently did, where it's a statistical summary of, of hundreds of studies, actually more than 230 studies involving more than 20,000 test subjects, uh, what we found, um, uh, and the balls here now, the size of the balls represent the number of uh, effect sizes that were available for analysis, what we found was tremendous variation across studies. So the wings here represent the 95% confidence interval in the effect sizes that were observed across studies. So what this means is that, for example, heart rate variability, which is a measure of parasympathetic nervous system activity, might go up during sadness, might go down during sadness, or it might stay the same. Blood pressure goes up, but it might go up a little, or it might go up a lot. And there was significant overlap in the effect sizes between emotion categories, so in um, anger in instances of studies of instances of fear, of disgust, of happiness, of um, in even a neutral um, induction. So no matter how you analyze these data, even with machine learning, um, there is, it's not been possible to identify a single type, a single pattern for anger or sadness or fear that generalizes across studies. Um, generally, this is interpreted as a failure to replicate uh, findings. But there's another possibility here. And the possibility is that variation is the norm. If a human brain and a human body are complex dynamical systems whose outputs depend on many weak, nonlinear interacting influences, and we don't measure those influences, uh, the fuller web of those influences, then their impact is free to vary and masquerades as error variants when, in fact, uh, there actually may be structure in that variation if we had designed the experiment to actually discover it. So my big claim for today is that psychological science should employ a population mindset. We should be embracing variation. Variation among individual minds is real and important, even if it screws up uh, you know, a t-test or an f-test. You know, so is the variation that occurs within a person across contexts. And if we want to understand the causes of this variation, we have to appreciate that uh, brains and bodies also are highly variable. Now, there are some psychologists who already take this approach. Um, for example, there's really great work by Randy Gallistel, who um, studies learning, uh, who, takes, who has some beautiful things to say about this and, and takes this approach. But generally speaking, um, psychologists um, haven't really been using a, a pop, what I would call a population mindset. Uh, and uh, I just want to show you some examples of what happens when you do. So I'm going to show you just a couple of experiments from our lab, brand new, hot off the press experiments, um, to take a look at what happens when we set out to discover and map that variation, uh, which you know masquerades as, as failure to replicate. So here's just an example of one study. We sent people out into their everyday lives. This is, by the way, um, Erica Siegel, who is a former graduate student in my lab. We sent people out into their everyday lives while measuring their peripheral physiology. So each day, uh, participants came to the lab and were outfitted with sensors uh, and portable equipment to capture uh, their electrocardiograms, their ECG, um, and their impedance cardiograms to measure vascular changes, as well as um, to measure movement and posture. And they wore this gear for an admirable eight hours a day 
for 14 days. Their own physiology triggered the sampling moments. So when their heart rate changed from baseline and they weren't physically moving, those were psychological events. Something was causing a change, but it wasn't a physical movement. And so we call this biologically triggered experience sampling. I should point out that we're now attempting to do this with FNIR signals, um, and uh, soon we'll try with portable EEG as well. But for now, this is a, a proof of concept kind of study, so we're just using um, uh, measures of the heart. At each sampling moment, participants receive prompts on their phone uh, to report their current affective experience. So they love, this person loved being in the study, was very happy, feeling very pleasant. Um, and then they were also asked to provide emotion labels with intensity ratings. And so this, collecting data like this, would allow us to inductively learn which mental features corresponded to which physiology patterns. We um, subjected the data to an unsupervised machine learning um, analysis, which I'm depicting here in just in extremely general terms. We used um, Dirichlet process Gaussian mixture modeling um, to, um, on individual data, the data from individual subjects, so we could um, explore the peripheral uh, physiological patterns of each person separately, allowing us to discover the patterns for that person uh, that were reliably present in the data for that person and then see what, gen observe what generalizes across people instead of just inferring. Um, and so first we'll just take a look at what we found across participants. So we identified 66 different clusters of physiological features, each one corresponding to a different pattern of physiological change. And I should say uh, the number of clusters uh, the clusters are on the x-axis and the number of participants who showed the clusters are on the y-axis. 44% of these, I'm sorry, um, 44 of these clusters of these patterns were observed in at least two subjects and um, 22 patterns were unique. So it's about a third of the patterns were unique. Interestingly, no pattern was found in all participants. Now if we look uh, at the number of patterns that were required to describe the physiology changes in each person. Three clusters were necessary to describe the physiology data for eight participants. Four clusters were necessary to describe the data for 12 participants. And five clusters uh, were necessary for 14 participants, and so on and so forth. So these are reliable uh, clustering solutions. Um, so imagine what would happen if we just ignored this structure uh, in this variation and we just aggregated across subjects to find, um, you know, means, basically. Um, it would add a lot of noise. Here are uh, the corresponding emotion labels for the 10 most reliable patterns. So the patterns here are list, are the clusters, the 10 most reliable clusters are uh, arrayed along the x-axis. And um, the words that were um, spontaneously volunteered by the participants are on the y-axis. Uh, and the, I've just separated these by pleasant and unpleasant um, adjectives, uh, adjectives that denote pleasant or unpleasant um, uh, feelings. So what we see is a many-to-many -many mapping. And what I'm showing you here is a cross-subject data, but actually uh, in the paper we, we present um, subject by subject data and you can see that what I'm showing you here actually holds for individual subjects as well. Uh, for example, cluster one, which was the most popular, uh, most re uh, replicable pattern, um, actually was associated with many, many different emotion words um, where the size of the ball indicates the number of participants who, who uh, or I should say the number of instances where this word was linked with this pattern. And even more interestingly, a single emotion category was associated with multiple uh, physiological patterns. Uh, I should note that surprise and anger were actually mentioned very, very, very infrequently um, in single instances, actually. So some subjects never reported them at all. Now, um, the point that I want to make here is this. This is a pilot study. It's a, just a proof of concept study. 
Um, the data so analysis so far suggests pretty clearly that the variability that we see in the data is not random, it's structured. We did not learn everything about the structure that we might want to know. This was, we sampled in a much higher dimensional way than studies typically do, but there were many things that we didn't sample in this study because it was a proof of concept study. And just so we're really clear, this study took two years to conduct and three times as long to convince a granting agency to give us the money to do it, which finally, uh, the uh, U.S. Army Research Institute actually finally um, uh, gave us the money to, to support this study. So that's how strong typological thinking is in psychology. Um, you know, we are currently involved now in, we're continuing to analyze these data, but uh, we are um, now launching um, studies uh, that will sample in a much higher um, dimensional space to n include not only this, subject's internal environment, but their external environment, um, as well as trying to incorporate brain data. So why, why is this important? Like, why go to all this trouble? Well, here's just a single example. One of the great unsolved problems in psychology is the lack of correspondence between subjective reports and physical measurements of the body. Generally speaking, we don't really understand how brains uh, work with, ha in conversation with bodies to conjure subjective experience, despite the fact that physicians think of it as, you know, the sixth vital sign. And almost whether or not you decide to see or are recommended to see a neurologist um, or uh, an internal, uh, someone for internal medicine or psychiatrist largely depends on your subjective report. Typically, uh, the correspondence between subjective reports and physiological measurements is a, can get as high as, you know, an effect size of 0.3, but usually hovers around zero. And that's true for every class of subjective reports that have ever been studied. So, um, you know, I've gone to NIH workshop after workshop after workshop about emotion, about stress, about various things where people are constantly um, bemoaning the fact that we don't really, we don't really understand the physical basis of, of subjective experience. And so one hypothesis we have is that this lack of correspondence is because we're not designing our experiments to sample and model the variation efficient, sufficiently. So here's just one example from our lab. We had subjects perform what's called a serial subtraction uh, uh, method, uh, a task. This is what's called a motivated performance task. Um, so, for example, you might start with a big number like 48,770 and ask your participant to subtract by seven, which is <laughs> and then you might give them the next number and subtract that by seven. And the whole time you'd be encouraging them in somewhat terse tones to go faster, which makes it stressful. Actually, in this study, we didn't need to stress people. It was stressful enough. We didn't have to berate them. Um, and then we had subjects rate their subjective experience of stress and their ability to cope with that stress, um, which would indicate whether or not they were threatened or challenged um, by the task. And then we gave them another task where we increased the difficulty and then we had them rate their experience, and then we just repeated. And the whole time, we were recording physiological changes, multimodal physiological changes. If we simply compare the changes for all participants to their self-report ratings, we can predict who was feeling threatened versus challenged at just above chance levels. So this is pretty standard, actually. But the other thing we did then was we used a feature extraction method um, to select the features, physiological features, that were most relevant for each subject using a, a, a objective um, criteria which had to do with the, um, the, the differences in the um, arithmetic tasks. And then we used uh, a, a machine learning algorithm, support vector machines, to identify subgroups or clusters of individuals who shared common physiological patterns which you see here. So we found generally three clusters, and, uh, so, which are indicated by the colors, and some individuals in gray who, um, who uh, were not, um, didn't belong to any cluster. 
And then we were able to improve the uh, accuracy of um, uh, predicting um, whether people subjectively felt threatened or challenged in two um, of the three clusters. And the third cluster is above chance, but not significantly different from what we did um, for what you could see for the whole group. So this is just um, in one small example. I mean, this, is, this might just seem like kind of like interesting, or maybe not, I don't know, <laughs> depending. But this is actually a really dramatic uh, finding. It's the first finding that we know of that actually can sh shows that um, we can uh, find a, a good correspondence between um, physiological measurements and self-report if we take advantage of the variability that is in the data in a structured way. In biology, this is called degeneracy, uh, or in neuroscience, it's sometimes called equifinality. It's the idea that structurally different ensembles of physical signals or physical changes or physical material um, can perform the same psychological function, or in this case, correspond to the same subjective report. We also see degeneracy in, um, in brain imaging. Um, so here what I'm showing you is degeneracy having to do with the category of emotion fear. Many scientists continue to believe that uh, a brain region called the amygdala contains the neurons for fear circuits. So here what I'm showing you are two structural scans, um, and these are monozygotic twins who have amygdala lesions. Their, lesion, their amygdala were uh, calcified at the age of 12. And what you're looking at here is a, a structural scan that is called a horizontal view, which is if you were to slice the brain like this and pop the top off and look down into the brain, this is what you would see. I mean, it would be bloodier, right? But this is what you would see. Thank you for laughing at that joke. I appreciate it. That was kind. Um, the, the front of the brain is at the top of the slide. And where the amygdala would be is outlined here. So sister BG. Uh, has difficulties experiencing fear and perceiving fear in other people. She can experience fear under very, very intense circumstances. Um, and she can perceive fear under very, con very constrained circumstances if you direct her attention to particular um, parts of the face. And when I say perceive fear, I mean the stereotype of fear, which in our culture is, right? Um, her sister, A.M., who is her identical twin, has no difficulties experiencing or perceiving fear. Because her brain has learned to make fear in a different way that doesn't require neurons um, from the amygdala. Now, um, we can also see degenerate patterns for fear just in standard brain imaging studies. Um, so here I'm showing you three supervised learning solutions for fear, each from a different study showing a different result. And in fact, the study that I showed you at the beginning from the Nature paper also had a pattern for fear, which doesn't look like these. And in fact, every paper that's ever been published that claims to find the biomarker for emotion, this emotion or that emotion category, finds variable results across studies. They don't look at all the same. Now, I want to point out here that First, that what we're looking at here is actually not, these are not brain states. These are statistical summaries. So uh, in other words, each of these patterns is a statistical abstraction consistent with the idea that fear is a population of variable instances, even in a single study. And there I'm, I put up a reference to a paper where we did um, uh, some um, simulation and modeling to show that you can classify uh, people's uh, bold patterns in the, the, the uh, blood oxygenation level patterns in their di in the uh, sc fMRI scans um, uh, at uh, at levels well above chance, um, but find that no single element in the overall pattern appears, no single element, no single voxel, basically, we divide the brain up into little three-dimensional cubes and we look at the amount of signal in each of those cubes. Not a single voxel uh, needs to be shared between an accurately classified, uh, ac accurately classified brain map from a single person um, 
uh, and the um, actual um, pattern that you see overall. So they're really abstractions um, that don't reflect in any way uh, what's happening in, in the individual brains. And so the question is, is this a failure to replicate? Well, might be. I mean, if you, here, here are a sample of uh, the studies that have been published to date. Um, the one on the bottom is mine uh, with Tor Wager. Um, if we look across the methods and so on, we can see that these studies vary quite a lot. They vary in their sample sizes. They vary in the number of emotion categories sampled. They vary in the number of stimuli used and in the types of stimuli to evoke emotion and in a whole host of uh, methodological features. Um, but it's also possible that there's structured variation within a person and across people that we're missing because all of these studies basically uh, are um, in one way or another aggregating data. So remember the study, the physiology study I just showed you, uh, where we inductively discovered the number of clusters in the data uh, from each subject using unsupervised machine learning. Well, we did that here too with this study, which is one of my studies. Um, this was a, a study that was originally published in 2013, um, and we reanalyzed it for uh, this paper to demonstrate that um, this is the supervised, this is the, this is the pattern from a supervised machine learning analysis uh, on, on aggregate data. And um, when we use um, Gaussian mixture modeling, again with the Dirichlet uh, process, um, we see uh, different numbers of clusters that are necessary to describe the bold signal uh, across subjects. And here's the data from, you know, one subject. So if we look at the number of trials where fear was induced or happiness was induced or sadness was induced, and we can see that um, it, the, there are equal, relatively speaking, equal numbers of trials um, in each cluster for, one, for that subject. And this is also true for the subject who um, had uh, showed three clusters in their data. And in fact, it's true for every subject that we um, analyze the data for. So um, what features characterize these clusters? That's the big question. They're not, the clusters don't correspond to focal motion categories. And so the answer is, check back with me in three years. Because <laughs> these data were not designed, this study wasn't designed for this purpose. It's really, again, it's a proof of concept study. But I'm very happy to report that the National Science Foundation has totally seen the light. And as of yesterday, uh, I heard that uh, the grant was funded that's for us to actually do this study properly. Um, and it only took two years this time. I just want to point out that this is, a, this is a project that I'm doing with a whole host of engineers and computer scientists. And actually, my, you know, my graduate student, uh, Chris, a graduate student who works in our lab, Christy Wesslin, is actually the one who, under my supervision, wrote that grant application. So this is like a big team uh, effort. So why does it matter? Well, here's just one example. Scientists have been searching for the brain biomarker of depression for some time. Depression, as we all know, is a very, very serious illness. It's actually at epidemic proportions in not just in college students, but actually across the age range. Uh, the World Health Organization projects that within the next 10 years, depression will, be, will overtake heart disease as the major killer worldwide. And we still have very little understanding of um, how to treat it um, and, um, and how to detect vulnerability, um, uh, vulnerability to it. So the question is whether what population's approach, population's um, mindset would help us, um, you know, would invigorate the r research on depression. So d here's just one example. One potential biomarker that scientists have focused on is hippocampal size. A smaller hippocampus is supposed to be predictive of depression um, but the problem is that the studies don't replicate, the studies that use aggregate data. So we took an existing data set that's online uh, of 159 subjects who were diagnosed with depression or anxiety or control subjects, and we did an unsupervised machine learning analysis, again, Gaussian mixture modeling, um, uh, on hippocampal volumes that were normalized to the, the size of the cerebral cortex. So they were allometrically corrected for um, the size of the cortex. 
Uh, and what we observed was what we call the Goldilocks effect, which is that some people had relatively larger hippocampi relative um, to the size of their cerebral cortex. Some people had lower, smaller hippocampi, and some people, I won't say it's just right, but it was sort of in the middle. And these three classes of people did not correspond in a one-to-one -one way with diagnoses of depression or anxiety. So um, each cluster contained people in all three categories. So what does this mean? We think it means that different people may have different biomarkers for depression and that the hippocampus, the hippocampal volume, is just one factor in a web of other influences, weak interacting influences that depend on things like genetics and particular life history. Um, so that depression as a disease is a population of heterogeneous instances, and if we design our experiments to study depression in this way, we will have a better, uh, way, a better chance of understanding it and treating it um, and maybe even um, preventing it. So the, the summary to this point is that variation is the norm and that we should be studying emotion categories uh, as populations of variable instances. I'm not saying that we should just do this because we can then predict physical signals better. This isn't just a prediction issue. I'm saying that the search for psychological types that has been with us in psychology for the last 150 years fundamentally misunderstands the nature of psychological phenomena. And just so we're clear, I am not referring to a couple of studies. I am referring to many, many, many published studies in our field. Historically, Psychology has been more concerned with trying to identify fixed types and less with, uh, you know, studying variation. And again, I just want to note, there are notable examples, right, of people who study individual differences and of people who take individual variation seriously. But, um, but as a field, think of the statistics we, we teach our undergraduates. Think about the way that our um, introductory psychology textbooks are actually organized. Um, uh, you know, the table of contents is a list of um, faculties of, um, of psychological categories. Um, I'm suggesting that if this is the way we continue to do things, searching for the biomarker for this emotion category or that mood disorder, um, we're, we end up dealing with fictional um, beings in a fictional environment. So right about now, if I've done my job correctly, you should be experiencing a creeping sense of discomfort or maybe a not so creeping sense of annoyance with me. And you might be wondering, did, did the APS president just say that most of the published research in psychology is bullshit? <laughs> just between us, I would never go on the record as saying that. <laughs> but I will say, that I think uh, that we need a major course correction in how we think about the mind and behavior and how we do science as a consequence. And this comes with profound opportunities, profound opportunities for discovery. Right? There's a wonderful book uh, by uh, Stuart Firestein, who's a biologist. Um, it's a little book called Ignorance. And it's a fantastic treatment of the wonderful opportunities um, that await us when we find out we've been doing things wrong, or maybe not in the best way. And these opportunities are not just for psychologists, but for everyone who studies behavior or the mind. Now, of course, the great William James, uh, who some, some consider to be the, you know, one of the founders of American psychology, knew this 130 years ago when he wrote, the varieties of emotion are innumerable. The trouble with emotions in psychology is that they are regarded too much as eternal and sacred psychic entities, like the old immutable species in natural history. And here he's referring to the way that the category of species was understood before Darwin. And James went on to say 
or right. But if we regard them as products of more general causes, them being emotion categories, as species are now regarded as products of heredity and variation, then the mere distinguishing and cataloging of emotion categories becomes of subsidiary importance. So the mandate of psychological science, according to James, at the dawn of psychology as a science, was to discover the general mechanisms that explain structured variation. Did we listen to him? OK, so while I was writing this talk and practicing it innumerable times, first of all, it was taking a much shorter time than it is now, which is pretty much always happens whenever I give a talk. But I thought, well, this might be a good place to stop, right here, right? Because I've just thrown a bunch of data at you. I've just suggested something pretty provocative, kind of blown up the field. And you know, why not end on cliffhanger? That's a good place to stop. But this is AAAS. And you guys can take a little more, right? Can't you? Yes. And so let's just for a minute consider James is challenged to discover the general mechanisms that explain variation in mental activity and in behavior. What might those general causes be? Well, studies that search for the brain bases of mental categories as types usually focus their questions on specific brain structures that are supposed to create those types. Like, so they ask where, where questions. Where is the brain circuit for fear? Where is the brain circuitry for episodic memory? Instead, though, a population's mindset asks how questions. How does the brain make an instance of fear? How is the brain conjuring episodic memory? And this actually has been one of the major projects in our lab for the past decade. Our approach takes inspiration from another uh, paradigm shift that's happening in neuros this time in neuroscience called predictive processing. And as is the case often in science, you know, you know that something's really important when people discover it again and again and again and they give it different names. So people also call this active inference and they also call it the Bayesian brain and they also call it belief propagation. Um, you could just call it uh, associative processing. There are many names you could give to it. Um, unconscious inference, if you want to go back all the way to Hemholtz, which we will. Um, but the idea is that in daily life, it feels like we encounter situations in the world at, like with stimuli and we react to them. But predictive processing is the hypothesis that the brain is constantly predicting, constantly anticipating uh, what it's going to encounter next and what it has to do next. Uh, I'm just gonna give you the gist of how this works given time constraints, um, but I'd be happy to point you to more than one of the more than 500 empirical uh, studies that we've identified in the literature that actually support uh, this uh, hypothesis. When considered together, these studies form a coherent neurobiologically inspired research program that explains how the variety of mental events that make up your mind, that make up your mental life, are constructed from the same anatomical and neural features. That is, the same general causes. So here's the gist. If we take your brain's point of view for a moment, your, you, your brain is basically entombed in a dark, silent box called your skull. And it has to learn what's going on around it in the world by scraps of information that it receives from uh, the sensory uh, environment, right? Light, so changes in light and chemicals and air pressure and so on. But these um, are the, it's receiving the effects of some set of causes. And it doesn't know what the causes are. It has to guess. Ditto for any information coming from the body. So your brain is constant. Right now, you know, you're sitting here listening to me, um, not aware of the fact, I hope, uh, that there is a drama playing out inside your own body um, where there is constant uh, stream of sensory input uh, that is uh, uh, reaching your brain. And again, your brain has to, these are the effects of some set of causes. Your brain has to figure out what are the causes. You have an ache in your gut. Is that hunger? Is that uh, anxiety? 
Is that uh, a feeling that somebody is guilty of a crime if you're, let's say, in a courtroom? So how does your brain solve this, what is in effect an inverse inference problem or a reverse inference problem? And the answer seems to be by remembering past experiences that are similar in some way where the physic to the present, where the physical changes in the world and the body are in some way functionally similar to um, uh, something that's happened um, uh, in the past. And so the general idea here is that you have a, dyna a complex dynamical system in your skull uh, built with neurons and other biological elements that are continually re-implementing past experiences. Um, and every action you take, every experience you construct, it's all happening automatically without your awareness, begins as a population um, uh, of past experiences that are your brain's hypotheses, best guess, of what is going to happen next. Each hypothesis is a plan for action, that is how to change the internal systems of the body in order to support motor movement and what those movements should be. And then what you are likely to see and hear and smell and feel as a result. That is, these um, past experiences, this population uh, of instances that your brain generates are perceptual inferences about upcoming sense data. So your brain is a population generator that is generating statistical inferences, um, which are guesses about what actions are likely to be most beneficial in the next moment, given the probable cause of the sensory input. And sense data from the body and the world help to select the instance, the representation that best fits the particular situation. And that's what becomes your action guides your action and becomes your experience. So as a, as a heuristic, this is basically uh, the biology of meaning making. And each time a hypothesis is chosen and it becomes your experience and your, guides your actions, its prior probability is strengthened, making more likely that the brain will construct it again. Now if I had more time, I would discuss with you how this changes our understanding of what memory is, of what a concept is, and what categorization means. Um, but I don't, so I'm happy to answer questions. Um, uh, you know, I'll stick around if people have questions afterwards. Um, but I do want to point out that this idea um, you know, is also been lost and rediscovered many times in psychology, um, I including, uh, but not limited to, um, uh, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz um, when he wrote about um, unconscious inference. So neuroscientists now are actively engaged in trying to sort out how prediction signals are constructed in the hippocampus, in the cerebellum, um, in the hippocampus, in the cerebellum, which you can only see here tucked under the cortex, and in the cerebral cortex. And in, in my lab, uh, we've been working with neuroscientists and psychologists and engineers and uh, computer scientists to, um, on a whole brain model that integrates all of these without losing the mind, right? Without losing the mental features that make your experience. And so here's, I'm just going to show you one really quickly, one nugget that we've been working on and then we'll wrap up. There's over 30 years of research, really rich empirical research in uh, anatomical studies of, of track tracing studies in primates and other mammals to suggest that certain neurons in the cerebral cortex, by virtue of their architectural arrangement and their connectivity, give rise to prediction signals which then propagate out to motor and sensory uh, regions in the brain. These neurons where prediction signals are thought to emerge um, are located in the shaded parts of this diagram. So here what I've done is I've just taken the cerebral cortex. Um, the left is a lateral view and the right is a medial view. So if you take the brain and you crack it open like an egg and you just look at the inside surface, that's what you see on the right. And I've just plastered onto that um, some demarcations from uh, uh, the structural demarcations. This is from, the, they're called Broadman areas, but uh, done by um, uh, Broadman. Um, there are actually um, pretty standardly used in um, these, um, this mapping is pretty standardly used in neuroscience. 
and the regions that I've shaded in gray are the regions, and I should also say the hippocampus as well, um, are regions that are thought to, where prediction signals are thought to emerge and then propagate out um, to the rest of the brain. These regions have another name. They're called limbic regions, actually, by virtue of their structure. So the irony here is that um, limbic regions, which scientists thought were the home of emotions and the most reactive parts of the brain, um, were, uh, uh, you know, are actually, um, we think, uh, the, the, the source of prediction signals that drive perception and action throughout your brain. Not just during instances of emotion, but for all mental events from the moment that you're born until the moment that you die, your brain uh, is uh, predicting sensory input from the world and anticipating how to act on them with limbic cortices. The other thing which limbic cortices do, and in fact the reason why they evolved, or a reason why they evolved, not the reason, or may say it this way, they evolved and they perform a, a major basic function, which is to regulate your body. Um, this is a quote from uh, uh, the neuroscientists Peter Sterling and um, uh, Laughlin. The core task of all brains is to regulate the organism's internal milieu by anticipating the needs of the body and preparing to satisfy them before they arise. What this means is that metabolism and energy regulation may be another core mechanism that is important to mental events. Because as your brain is doing whatever it does, seeing, feeling, thinking, it's also regulating your body. And if we look evolutionarily, we can see that brains did not evolve to think and see and feel. They evolved to regulate an ever-expanding and more complex body. And so your brain thinks and feels and sees in the service of regulating your body. I don't mean circulating glucose levels here. I mean energy regulation in a very basic way, which scientists call um, allostasis. So I'm going to wrap up while I'm really going much longer than I had thought. So um, I'll just uh, end by saying that um, there is uh, an opportunity here to do science very differently um, by studying um, psychological phenomena as populations of variable instances. Because uh, the variation is real. We, as humans, um, human brain creates statistical summaries of those variations, and then we believe those summaries are real. And as scientists, we reify those summaries as the phenomenon of interest. But um, as William James pointed out, uh, the great snare of the psychologist is the confusion of his own standpoint with that of the mental fact about which he is making his report. This is naive realism, right? And it's related to essentialism, which was a whole other section in this talk which I removed um, uh, because I didn't have time. So here are the takeaways. Variation is the norm. Think about studying, designing your experiments differently. If you want to understand the cause of this variation, ask questions about mechanism and computation, you looking at general causes, and avoid naive realism. If you want to know more about this, you can look at any of my papers from uh, my lab. Um, you can look at this book, which Roddy uh, mentioned, and my new book, which is actually a series of little essays about the brain. And the real heroes here, you know, are the lab. I, uh, they do all the really hard work. I just get to stand up here and have fun telling you about it. Um, uh, but I want to point out in particular, I don't have a pointer, but I want to point out in particular Christy uh, um, Westland, who's third from the right. Yeah, second from the left, Katie uh, Homan, who um, actually conducted, they were the lead uh, graduate students on much of the research that I showed you today. Thank you for your patience.